Hello, and welcome to Women in Business, where we interview entrepreneurs and senior managers and show you the strengths, successes, obstacles, and roadblocks women experience in business. Since I believe every person in business needs to be visible, I'd like to invite you to watch www.sob6, that's the number six, tips.com, which will give you some valuable information should you get the call to be on radio or TV, which I think is extremely important. If you'd like to contact me personally, drop me a line at Gail Carson, that's G-A-Y-L-E, Gail Carson 13 at gmail.com, or go to my website, www.spunkyoldbroad.com and sign up for my weekly newsletter. Hi everybody, it's Dr. Gail Carson and we are in the Women in Business show and I want to ask all of you to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or YouTube uh, for any new contact we keep putting out. I am delighted with our guest today who is Michelle Connell. She's a CFA, owns Porsche Capital Management LLC, which is a registered investment advisory firm specializing in the investments of foundations, charities, and high net worth individuals. Porsche Capital Management is the only investment management firm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to be owned by a female CFA charter holder, an important resource in a world where 60% of women retire in poverty. Michelle's expertise is backed by more than 20 years of financial experience and management positions with large investment boutiques and private banks. Welcome, Michelle. We are absolutely delighted to have you today. Well, Dr. Carson, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Boy, that is not a good statistic where you say that... Uh, uh, you know, that, that what, uh, how many, 60% of women retire in poverty? That is just, that's sacrilegious in a way. So how yes. did you get, end up in investment? So tell us your story and tell us why so many women are, are uh, not really achieving what they need to achieve, especially in retirement. Okay. Well, I will give you the short version of my story uh, I am told by my mother that I loved the stock market and the ticker tape when, as early as five years old, uh, I would watch the ticker tape on the side of a building and be mesmerized by it. And I started watching Wall Street shows at, from a very young age. And at about the age of 12, my parents divorced. My mother did not have a high school education. And she really had a difficult time holding on to a position. So at 15, I uh, kind of fudged my age. And I ended up working in a ghetto McDonald's to support my mom and my sister. But I always had this dream of doing something in finance. And I ended up working at a bank. I found out what a portfolio manager was. And I was like, boy, that's really interesting. And I looked at the job description, and they all had CFA on it. And I'm like, what is a CFA? Well, basically, a chartered financial analyst is the highest designation you can get on Wall Street. And if you want to manage mutual funds, which I've done, or manage institutional money, which I've done, you need that designation. But unfortunately, uh, we have less women going into money management now than we did 20 years ago when I got my charter. And I can say that because I also teach uh, year one and year three uh, in North Texas for that designation. But women just seem to have a fear uh, about money and anything to do with finance. Um, there have been some behavioral finance stories or studies rather that have shown that whenever you bring up the issue of financial planning or investments to women, they just resonate fear. And I just, that comes from an early age and somewhere we need to go back into the school system and not wait until adulthood and get more women comfortable with this for the women who are facing, you know, in their working years now, and especially those that are close to retirement, they need to learn how to become more comfortable with risk and look at what they can control. Well, and you did say now that the pandemic that we're in just put 
uh, you know, women behind uh, even further. And uh, they're just not catching up with men's retirement savings. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is that when there are job losses, frequently women uh, lose their jobs uh, before men. And when we do lose our jobs, uh, especially those when we're over 45 and 50, nine times out of 10, the position that we're going to take after we lose our position right now, nine times out of 10, we are going to make less money. You combine that with the fact that most of us right now are caregivers to children and uh, a lot of the uh, child care facilities. Uh, I work with a charity here in Dallas Fort Worth that builds child care in the marginalized areas. 50% of your child care centers are closing, at least in this part of the world. So those women are having to pick up the slack there or they're teaching their children online. And a lot of us, myself included, are also, you know, we're taking care of our parents, you know, during this period of time. So it's very hard for us to focus on our needs. And unfortunately, the financial needs and the investment needs seems to go to the very bottom of the list, especially during a period of crisis. Well, it's true. And of course, the people who are living in multi-generational households have an advantage because they've got someone to look after the kids. But many people are not in that situation. So what about you, Michelle? What obstacles did you face along the way? I mean, have have these things changed since you started 20 years ago? No, unfortunately, they, they haven't. That's one reason why I had to start my own firm is that um, uh, my career path was as follows. Uh, when you look at the private firms that I've typically worked at, I was the only female portfolio manager. That's still very often the case. Um, I was the head of a tech sector for a major bank. I was a co-manager on a mutual fund, but I was always the only woman in the room. And that's really not changing uh, right now. If you look at the statistics, only 1% of the monies, that means institutional monies, that are managed in the United States, which is roughly you know, six, $70 trillion, 1% is managed by women and minorities. And that statistic is not growing. So I, I have went through a lot, as you can probably guess, working at male-only firms. And I, I will say some of my biggest champions, though, have been men and continue to be, you know, as I've started my own firm. But part of the reason why I had to start my own uh, RIA investment firm in Texas is I wasn't one of the guys. And that can be a very big issue. And I think finance and investment seems to be the last bastion of power and money. And so it's very, and I also think a lot of women and minorities don't even know about the, this career as an option until it's too late. Well, that's true. I think that's very true. Um, and the fact that, you know, you, you had to do it on your own and, and open your own firm, almost like a, a notorious RBG in the finance world. Uh, I have to say, Michelle, uh, do you think that it's because money isn't talked about with women? Do you think that it's because um, it just isn't taught in in undergrad schools? I mean, you know, uh, going from the seventh or eighth or ninth grade on to whenever graduation is? I mean, why do you think it's so difficult for women to get into the financial arena or to even be aware of it? Because I think if they were aware of it, they'd fight for it more, and then there would be more representation, and then there would be less difficulty. But what's your opinion? I think a lot of it, you're, you're correct, a lot of it is a, a lack of knowledge. Uh, most people, I, I up until recently, I was an adjunct professor of finance at University of Texas in Dallas. And most when I did teach corporate finance, every business major has to have that. 
women already by that point when they're a sophomore and they're a business major too, they're afraid of finance. And so I would try to encourage them to, you know, come into the field. It's very difficult to get people to even, or women rather, to even consider that. So I think you have to start even before high school. I personally would like to see more of a a reach out, not only just for women, but, but for minorities, because the only way you're going to have power, whether you're a female or a minority, is have control over your finances, being able to control your destiny. If you want to start a, a business, et cetera, you have to understand finance and how, you know, just the necessity, pure necessity of that. So those conversations have to start earlier. And we also have the hurdle of, I think it's also for a lot of women, risk, we're not good with risk, but we need to get a better handle on the fact that risk is not a bad thing. Actually, when you look at the results of hedge fund managers, especially during COVID, uh, women have a few women hedge fund managers that, have out, uh, that are out there have outperformed handily their male peers. And I think the reason why they have, and I also have been very good at outperformance, is we're very good at understanding downside risk, but then we have to add that downside risk piece to upside risk. So women just can't look at it, okay, what could I lose? And going into fear mode, balancing that out and saying, okay, what could happen on the upside? And men are usually very optimistic and they, they over-risk. They take too much risk in a portfolio and that's why they lose. I think women need to take that advantage of how we do you know, hold on to downside risk and balance it out and we could handily continue to outperform and hopefully manage more money, uh, if, you know, not, for an, not necessarily for an institution, but even for an individual woman, you know, to take over her finances because there's a 90% probability that a woman sometime during her lifetime is going to be responsible for her household's finances. You, it's folly not to understand something because your family is going to depend on it. Oh, well, I totally agree with you. And I think women are much better at managing money than men are. Although I will tell you, when I got married, I said to my husband, <laughs> I know most people will think this is crazy, but I said, I'm not going to marry you unless I manage the money. And I didn't know what he was going to say, but he said, thank really? goodness. He, he said, thank goodness. And when he was working, you know, and getting a paycheck, he would just bring that paycheck directly to me. And when he started his own business, you know, he ran his business, but I manage the finances and our investments. So it's really interesting. Uh, I mean, I was just fortunate that I was married to a guy like that. But, um, you know, uh, I would ask you that, you know, most women, I would think, would want to know that they're financially secure. So how can they plan for the long term? I think we need to, as individuals, if we want to have the ability to retire or at least at least have it as an option, because a lot of us don't necessarily want to retire full time, but maybe we want to scale back. Maybe we want to do more with our charities. We need to understand what we have to have in terms of investments. At that point, we're, we're starting to dial back our careers, figure out what expenses you're going to have, at that point in your life cycle, figure that you're going to work another 20 years, uh, project that out. Typically, if you take your yearly expenses, multiply it by 25 because more often than not, you shouldn't take more than 5% out of your portfolio. Otherwise, you're going to have less money as you get older. But if you take what you're going to spend, multiply it by 25 That gives you a rough goal of what you need to have in your portfolio when you retire. And I think a lot of people don't do that. I think actually a lot of people just kind of throw up their hands and say, I'm not going to have enough. And they just 
don't look at the end game and then plan backward. That's something I always tell my students, plan backward from the test date when I teach the CFA. That way you have some control that when you do meet that end point, that you succeed. And I think that's going to be even more critical going, going forward because you look at estimates for the stock market and even the bond market the next 10 years. We've been very lucky since 2008. The stock market's made over 10% a year. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Northern Trust have all cut those estimates in half for the next 10 years. So in the past, if you just threw some money into your 401k, you probably were going to be, eh, you're going to have some money in it. Now you're going to have to be even more uh, methodical and strategic in how, not only how you come up with that end number that you're going to need in 20 years or so, but also how am, how am I going to get to that in terms of my returns? Because you're not going to be able to do it with being a passive investor, it's not going to work anymore. So how does one become more financially literate? I mean, you normally don't find financial literacy topics, webinars, books, interesting. <laughs> you know, you don't find them stimulating. You don't find them exciting. They're numbers. Uh, how do you get someone interested in financial literacy? Well, I'm, you're motivating me to write my book because <laughs> when I was 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 teaching uh, uh, at UT, uh, I would always tell stories about what I'd been through on Wall Street, whether it'd been you know the tech bubble blowing up, 9/11. Uh, what I put up with, you know, when the markets were going up, markets were going down, and how I controlled risk. People need to learn with stories. So when I would tie those stories to financial concepts, people were more involved. Like we, we all learn through stories. So I think if you can find somebody that will talk about their experience, maybe in a story form, maybe not, but just explain their experience how they dealt with different points in market cycles that will help um, because you're right when we have a blur of numbers in front of us and equations and returns people's brains just have to turn happen to turn off but if you look at it one point in time like right now I'm looking at uh, presidential elections this weekend back to 1940 to see what has happened you know, on the other side, we all know we're going to have volatility right now, but what happens on the other side when different types of candidates win or different economies or wars are taking place? It's pretty interesting. So I think looking at it from a historical perspective, that helps people too, because it's not just, okay, the market did this during this period of time, and you don't understand the context around it. I think, you know, if you don't have the ability to pick up the book or a webinar, or you can't find something you're comfortable with, pick up Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal. You know, just look at the personal finance section. Pick up Financial Times, and you can get an idea. of Look at the individual companies to start with. That will give you an idea of the story of that company, how that it got from its you know, beginning to where it is now, you know, where they took their missteps, what they did right. And all those things are almost like a Greek or a Roman, you know, mythology, but modern times. For me, for me, that's how I maintain my interest is I understand what's beneath the market, you know, the individual players and how they're zigging and zagging. So what are you advising clients to do pre-election and post-election and for the next few years? What are, you, what are you advising people to do? Well, since August, I've been concerned that the markets are expensive. And even though the markets have pulled back in the last few weeks, the S&P, I think, 
before today was down roughly 10%. Um, I, I hold, I'm holding about 25% cash. 25% of my portfolio is not hedged. I have the ability to hedge on the downside. So let's, let me give you an example. You have the ability to use options, call and stock options, so that when the market goes down, I will only go, some managers, for example, will hedge it so you only go down the first 5%. Then you don't go down the next 15 or 20 but you're going to limit your upside. Right now, I'd rather protect my downside and also participate in the upside and maybe give up some of that upside. So holding cash, hedging what I have, also taking some profits off the table. I've been doing that with some of the larger companies and especially technology, because not just from a profit and loss perspective, but also taxes, because I'm trying to weigh in the possibility that if we do have an administration, that taxes, especially capital gains taxes, are going to be a lot higher here. So I'd rather book some of those now for my taxable uh, portfolios and clients and uh, reallocate my risk. So we have just five minutes left, uh, Michelle. Where can people find you? Where can they contact you? I don't know if you have a free gift that you want to offer our listeners, but how can they get in touch with you? Okay, well, my website is www.portia-capital.com. And I'll just say I named my firm after Portia, the female heroine. There's trying to find a story. Portia was a female heroine in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice who stood for ethics and justice. So I want to have something that would resonate with women. Now, if there's anybody in your audience that's interested in a portfolio review or a risk review of what they do own, I'm happy to provide that for individuals and spend some time on that. And um, I think I had agreed to to um, total analyses of their portfolios. Fantastic. I know that there are some women listening. Listen, if you don't know where you're going with your finances and you say, well, should I invest here or should I invest there? I hear so many stories. Uh, go and see Michelle. I mean, you can you can reach her, you know, at uh, uh, her various places, her website, her company is Remember. Porsche Capital Management, LLC. She's located in Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, fantastic uh, information today, Michelle. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I add, subtract, multiply, and divide very quickly. Anything else, I don't do. And when <laughs> I see graphs and charts, my mind goes blank. But I do know the value of money, and I know what it can do. I don't think you should be obsessed with it, but I think you need to be aware. You need to be able to make good choices. That's that's the key. You need to be able to, to make good choices. So in our last few minutes, um, I'll just say to our listeners, um, remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and YouTube for new content. Uh, if you are interested in my over 50 free Facebook group, it's the Virtual SOB Club. And if you are uh, wanting to contact me, you can contact me at spunkyoldbroad.com. I have plenty of contact information there. You can get in touch with me and I'll be glad to get back with you as soon as possible. Is there anything that you would like to say in our last minute and a half, Michelle, that we have not talked about? I think we're going to be facing some interesting times after the election or when we know that we have a president. If we look at history, typically the market does well after election. So come up with a list of uh, some ideas of what you would buy. I think there are going to be some good opportunities available to us to go back through history. The, the end of the year after election typically is good. So, you know, be opportunistic and uh, give yourself some credit. You, you can do this. Women, as I said, our results are better and we just need to own it. 
That's that's I think a very key message. Women out there, you need to own it. And if you're trying to build a portfolio, I would suggest getting in touch with Michelle. She can help you in the direction you should take. Uh, you should make sure that you um, you know are you are saving part of your income, whatever that be, whether it be a business or whether it be salary. Uh, you need to do that because you never know when something is coming like we've been going through now with COVID. And so many people have been misplaced uh, and out of jobs and nothing is on the horizon. You need to be aware. And I think Michelle's the one who can help you with this. So I'm going to encourage you to be in touch with her. Remember that her company is called, uh, it's, it's absolutely the uh, Porsche Capital Management, LLC. Thanks so much for being with us, Michelle. It has just been a delight and a pleasure, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate you having me today. and Wish everybody well. Hi, this is Dr. Gale, and I wanted you to know I have a whole bunch of other things to offer you. If you go to spunkyoldbroad.com, you will see an array of SOB stuff for sale and all our latest products and additions. If you're interested in getting on TV, I have a brand new course, Get on TV. And if you want to start your own business, you'll want my SOB Guide to Business Success. I know you'll love them all. I guarantee it. Thanks for listening to Women in Business. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you have any suggestions as to who you'd like me to have as a guest, just email me at gailcarson 13 at gmail.com. Be sure to check out www.sob6tips.com. And in the meantime, go to www.spunkyoldbroad.com to see the resources I have for you.